Hi everybody and welcome back to Thursdev. I'm your host Luke and with Final Fantasy 15 looming right over our heads and looking honestly a little mediocre, I wanted to delve into some of the things that the series has done right in its past. When I was a kid, I played a lot of role-playing games, both tabletop and video game, but if you'd asked me between the ages of probably 8 and 18 what my favorite RPG game was, the response probably would have been either Fallout or Final Fantasy, depending on which had had a more recent release. Though they weren't overly complex back in their day, with the exception of the venerable Tunnels of Doom on my dad's TI-99 4A, I got my first real taste of modern console RPGs with the first Final Fantasy. The plot was bare bones, but surprisingly compelling for its day, and as a child I was captivated and found the game surprisingly easy to navigate, an extremely important factor in deciding whether the game would be accessible enough for me to really grasp at that age. Final Fantasy was far from a perfect game, especially by modern standards. It had some terrible problems with imbalance, many of its internal systems are bugged beyond belief, and it was a poster child for how grind can become a problem. It was never a long game, but that was artificially inflated by way too much grinding. First for level, and most egregiously for money so that you could buy proper equipment and magic, like the infamously 60,000 gold 8th level spells where the most valuable and simultaneously most dangerous monsters only gained you 5,000 gold pieces at best. When you weren't locked in an endless loop of stepping back and forth looking for manageable encounters, however, the game somehow managed to stumble upon a very intelligent manner of slowly expanding the game's world for the player and advancing the plot while still making the game feel about as open world as you could be in that era. Say what you will about the railroading done by Final Fantasy's recent entries, the original took the player on a very tightly managed journey in a very elegant manner by gradually increasing the playable area through the introduction of new forms of travel. Now, I should take a moment to say that there are certainly arguments to be made that Final Fantasy 1 is as much a corridor as its modern brethren, with as little content as it has, but there are definitely opportunities here and there for sequence breaking. During the prologue, the game essentially is fixed, a small village in a castle in front of which sits a dock area, you're informed in the game's introductory text role that you're the four warriors of light and you each carry an orb. The orbs are somehow important to the well-being of the planet, but otherwise little information is given. The natural urge is to enter the village or castle, and eventually, through a small amount of exploration, the player learns that the Princess Sarah has been kidnapped, and you're meant to rescue her from a rogue knight called Garland. The quest is about as straightforward as it can be, the player can simply follow the only possible route north until they encounter another ruined castle, where there's really nothing to do but enter a central chamber and fight the enemy within. Defeating Garland allows the player to gain access to a newly built bridge across a nearby strait and further towards the cave of the witch Matoya and the town of Provoka. This simple system of subplot leading to your next objective, which in turn expands your game world, sets a precedent throughout the entire game. For each new opening, you're presented a place to go, a job to do, and a period of exploration. Upon finishing the new quest, you're rewarded with some method by which you can further open your venues of exploration and begin the cycle anew. Provoka gives you access to the ship, which opens for you the entirety of the Inner Sea. The Inner Sea, however, is a closed circuit and the player has no option but to explore the perimeter until they find the city of Elfland. The game asks the player to find an herb that will cure their prince's magical sleep, which can be gained from Matoya, which leads you on a multi-tiered fetch quest around the Inner Sea until you can eventually get access to the Outer Sea via acquisition of the TNT. The Inner Sea, in contrast to the prologue, can be seen as a sort of Act 1 of the game, one in which you're introduced to the game world and important places that you'll need to return to later. Upon entering the Outer Sea, though you can see many new areas, you're really only given access to two new places, the Earthland with its town Melmond, and the surprisingly wet Fireland wherein sits the town of Crescent Lake. Melmond, which is conveniently located just outside the newly created strait exiting the Inner Sea, reintroduces the plot of the crystals with the introduction of a land blighted by the Earth Fiend and another period of exploration, culminating in the defeat of the Earth Fiend and acquisition of the Canoe in Crescent Lake. With the Canoe in their control, the player is not only able to access and challenge the Fire Fiend, then travel to the Ice Cave to get the floater item, they now gain access to a new form of port disembarking from their ship at a river mouth directly to their canoe, making even more new lands available to them, including the town housing the entrance to the water palace, and the desert wherein the player can use the floater they gain to unearth the airship, the final vehicle, 
and the one that opens up access to the third act. Being the center point of the game, entry to the third act is punctuated by the player's undergoing of Bahamut's trial and the maturing of the characters into their advanced classes. It introduces the final two fiends, and upon defeating them, opens access to the finale, a return to the very beginning of the game and Garland's castle and the final showdown against a creature called Chaos 1000 years into the game's past. At any given point in the game, the player always has a short-term objective, and major overarching plot points are unraveled gradually and without undue convolution. Though the areas in between these major milestones are mired in some painful grind, the game never confuses the player as to what their goal should be. It also succeeds in avoiding meandering, as at any given point in time, though backtracking is an option, only two or three new villages become available at a time, ensuring that though certain tasks can be done quote out of order, the player always has their next objective laid out and can by and large guarantee that they won't encounter a point in time, assuming that they're talking to NPCs enough to learn what the most recent problem of the day is, where they don't know what to do next. On a personal level, I'm a big fan of open world games. I've put more time collectively into the Bethesda Fallout games than most of the other games on the rest of my library combined, but in order to tell a compelling story and keep the player on track, a certain amount of non-ambiguity and goal structure becomes a requirement. One of the systemic problems in the open modern world game is that with few exceptions, it's easy to get caught in a strange limbo of plot urgency offset by a massive playground of distractions. The distractions ultimately are the main draw of these games, but they also, by definition, take the player attention away from the achievement of core plot goals. Some development teams have made attempts to incorporate completion of side goals into the plot in ways, but as often as not, this is seen as little more than padding. When approaching a game that has a central narrative, we've seen a real market divergence in the last decade between narrative-driven and event-driven games, and though I believe it would be unkind of me to characterize the average open-world game as being plot-deficient, the plot is frequently interrupted by large bouts of player distraction, leading to moments of lost focus and even the best of the games in its genre. We have a tendency as designers to want, when giving players agency in their plot progression, to give them free reign to do anything and go anywhere. This was a cornerstone in the design philosophy of the Bethesda Elder Scrolls and Fallout games, and I'm not against this, but I do believe that we can learn from the slowly expanding world of Final Fantasy 1. By giving us free reign in a limited space and rewarding the player who moves forward in our narrative with more space in which to exercise that freedom, you create a positive feedback loop of explore, achieve, expand, which also provides negative feedback to help deter overextension of the player and undo plot advancement. Incorporating those activities that are little more than distractions in other games into that feedback loop as well, if done correctly, can also contribute to a strong, motivating open world that your player might just feel like finishing one day. I know limiting a player in an open world game seems counterintuitive, but when so many open world games start out so promising but ultimately turn out to feel barren and uncompelling despite having far too many things to do, the metaphorical inch deep ocean, one wonders, maybe, just maybe, if a little bit of control exerted over the player, throttling content around narrative and conditioning the player to seek out the story, might just be worth exploring. The Final Fantasy series may have leaned a little bit too far in recent years toward being too narrative heavy for many. It remains to be seen as of this recording whether the game will be another 13 or if this open world that they're boasting truly has teeth, but let's remember that once upon a time, that storytelling, when mixed with compelling gameplay and a healthy dose of exploration, made for quite the video game cocktail. Thank you for watching this episode of Thursdev. I hope that it was informative, if not entertaining, and I truly hope that you'll join me again. If this video appealed to you and you're interested in more content like it, hit the subscribe button in the following screen or down below, and YouTube will deliver content right to your feed. We create new videos every day, including game development talks like this one every Thursday. Thank you as always for dropping by, and I'm looking forward to seeing you here again. Take care.